Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Chris, and I am an alcoholic. It has uh, it has been quite a pleasure uh, coming up here to Montclair and um, putting together the team of people uh, who have who have come up and shared of their experience, strength, and hope. And uh, you know, I'm I'm always uh, thrilled to participate and quite honored when asked to uh, to do these things. And we hope that you know we've we've brought. Um, brought a message of depth and weight and hope um, uh, up with us from the Bernersville area. You know, before I bring up uh, tonight's two speakers, we're gonna we're gonna end with a bang with uh, two uh, two wonderful wonderful guys, uh, Ian and Jonathan. I've I've known them for a long time, and um, Ian is quite possibly the most generous person I've met in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, with his time, with whatever he has, he's always there for people. Jonathan has done the extraordinary job of putting a website together for uh, for our home group, where people actually listen to our meetings around the world uh, on this website and I get emails from you know Australia and Europe um, asking questions about certain things and uh, it's it's really made it uh, it's really, it's really done a lot of good for uh, for carrying the message, and uh, you know these these two guys are very very good friends of mine. Um, one of the saddest things to happen in Alcoholics Anonymous, and through looking back on it, uh, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what went wrong or when it went wrong. But somewhere after the, after the 40s or in the 40s or in the 50s, I'm not even really sure. Um, the emphasis on the program of recovery started to be eclipsed by the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's a great thing unless you're in real trouble with alcoholism. Um, Meeting-based sobriety is, uh, even the book says, (coughs) it's a far cry from permanent recovery. The whole point of of the AA textbook in Alcoholics Anonymous is permanent recovery. Um, in this day and age, it's become all too prevalent uh, uh, to have revolving door uh, type of uh, type of things going on in AA. To have people relapsing and staying a year or two, going back out, going back into treatment, coming back, not really feeling the place is right, and not getting anything, still feeling terrible. And it's 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 really a crime because that's not that's not necessary. Uh, adherence to the original recovery process, as it's laid out in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, ensures permanent recovery. Uh, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. And it's very, very clear about what that path is. And that path is not doing 90 and 90 till the cows come home. That path is, that path is working the 12 steps, paying the money back, praying and meditating, working with other people, inventorying, uh, you know, inventorying your resentments and your fears and your harms on a continuing, uh, basis. Something that not a lot of us are real thrilled about. You know, when I, when I first showed up in AA and it'd be a step meeting and hear somebody go, you know, if they would have told me I did all those steps when I came in, I'd have been right out the door. And again, I would have to ask, you know, uh, would anybody care, really, if you went right out the door, you know? <laughs> you, you, you know, what do you, what do you really bring into this group that's of any value? Uh, but I don't judge, so I, uh, so... <laughs> So I don't I don't say things like that, you know. I'm very tolerant and accepting of uh, of all. But uh, but anyway, one of the things that's very very important to understand about the recovery process is if you take away my alcohol and you tell me to just suck it up, put the plug in the jug, and don't drink a day at a time. That ain't good enough for me. If you're going to take away the thing that I've been using to escape my emotion, the emotional travesty of my life, if you're going to take that away, you better have something to give me 
in return. You, you, you better, or else I'm just going to find sobriety untenable. Like, like 80% of the people who, who, who come in today, they find the sobriety untenable because they don't engage in the thing that will give them what they were looking for in booze in the first place. And you get that from practicing the steps. Now, I don't know of another progressively fatal illness in the world that has like 160 promises. If you engage in the treatment for this progressively fatal illness, you will receive it you will receive these unbelievable promises. It truly is remarkable. Uh we have a great deal in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the best deal out there for alcoholics. You know, you either die an alcoholic death, live life along spiritual lines, and if you're living life along spiritual lines, there are some amazing things that are going to be happening to you in your life. If you find that sobriety is just kind of like a long, slow uh, trudge every single day, and there's just not a lot of quality in your life, and you know things are always going wrong, and you're always depressed and everything. You're doing it wrong. You know, um, <clears throat> these guys are going to come up and they're going to share some of their experience about some of the promises that are inherent after you reco- work the recovery process. Look, <clears throat> your only choice, if you are alcoholic, and I'm not assuming that everyone is, but if you are alcoholic, r- sometimes the only shot you have is the spiritual shot, is to work the 12-step program. If you work that, a lot of really great things will happen in your life. And I want to bring, <clears throat> bring up my friend, uh, my friends Ian and Jonathan, and they're going to share a little bit about that. Wow. Look at top that. Um, I'm Ian. I'm an alcoholic. And, uh, oh. I'm Jonathan. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, I want to thank uh, you all for being here. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, I'm not going to do a lot of qualifying. I trust I belong in this room out here on a Monday night speaking about some promises that have come true in my life. Um, but I just, just out of curiosity, and I'm not singling anyone out, but is there anyone in the room that has less than 90 days? That's great. How about, um, is there anyone in the room that's currently going through the work with the big book sponsor in the big book? Wow. Great. Anyone writing, currently writing inventory? That's great stuff. You know, when, um, and this didn't happen to me when I had, and the reason I bring this up is it took me a lot longer than 90 days to, uh, to seek this. You know, to, to seek the solution that um, you guys are seeing. And, uh, and I suffered greatly in the beginning. And I know, you know, the thing that I could share is uh, a few years ago, I had a friend, you know, maybe 15 years ago, who had some horrible cancer. And he was dying. And, uh, and he went all over the world to try and find and meet people that, had recovered from the kind of cancer that he had and books and all this other stuff. And, you know, he took that in like with fervor, like, you know, like they say in the book, you know, like, uh, you know, a drowning man. And, uh, unfortunately he lost the bout to it. Uh, but the reason I bring it up is because when I came into, um, Alcoholics Anonymous, I was dying a different kind of death. And uh, it wasn't until later that, you know, the, the first promise of this book was brought to me. And I didn't understand it was a promise. It says, you know, how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. Here's a story, you know, <clears throat> of how many thousands of men and women have recovered from this fatal disease that we suffer from. And it's right here in a book. And... Uh, it just never really dawned on me that that, you know, I, I skipped over that. I skipped over all the stuff. And, you know, I, I was used to the promises uh, typical of middle-of-the-road meetings, you know, your typical ninth-step promises. 
<clears throat> and then, and then during those ter- times, I only really focused on uh, a few of those promises, and I and I wanted to know when are they coming true in my life, you know. I, they don't say that they're ninth step promises. It's just promises of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, when am I going to get rid of economic insecurity? And when are fear and this going to leave me? And it's, you know, and it wasn't until what you guys have here in this Bon Claire meeting, you know, in my own, uh, searching, I found people that had recovered from alcoholism through the big book and explained to me that if I wanted the promises that start on page 83 of this book, I had to start at the beginning and get to page 83. They weren't going to come. You know, that's a promise. You know, I'm not going to say that there's only one way to do this, but, you know, if, you know, if you do the steps as outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that Chris was talking before, you know, this is a program that offers these hundreds of promises. There's probably other ways to re- to stop drinking, but I can promise you that you're not going to get the promises that are outlined out of here. You're going to be dying a second death in recovery. And uh, and I'm a standing witness of it, 18 months removed from my last drink and uh, other non-conference approved substance, and <laughs> you know, and my best thinking was to put a gun in my mouth maybe and stop the pain because it was nothing else that was working, you know. You know, put a plug in the jug. I needed to put a plug in my mouth. I didn't do something. Uh, it was just horrible. Anyhow, my sobriety date is uh, November 6, 2006. Um, I have a home group, a vision for you in Union, and a second group, the Spiritual Awakenings Group in Bernardsville. I'm going to let, uh, you know, one of the promises in this book is that uh, you're going to meet new people and, and meet some of the best people in your life. Um, and I look around this room and there's people that I speak to every day, you know, based out of living this promise. And this is a truly a promise to me, the whole recovery. And, you know, Jonathan's one of them. Uh, you talk about a gift in someone's life in recovery. And uh, I was truly blessed to have Jonathan in my life. He He's an epitome of a recovered alcoholic. He's um, what Chris was saying, his... His level of service to our Bernardsville group is second to none. The, the, if nobody's been up there on the website and tapped into seeing upcoming events and what's going on and speaker downloads and workshops and stuff that's just not available, you can, you know, we all owe a huge thanks to Jonathan. And also, I want to thank, um, I know Bill stepped out, but, uh, I want to thank Barefoot Bill for, um, coming here every week in and week out and taping this so these sessions are available long after um, we leave Montclair and something that you may have heard and you want to re-listen to it again and you'll be able to. So without uh, further ado, we'll start this session and I'll bring up my uh, sponsee brother, Jonathan. Thank you. I'm Jonathan. I'm an alcoholic. Um, you know, I have, uh, like Chris and, uh, and Ian have shared, I, I was many years in AA and going to a bunch of meetings, um, uh, you know, talking to people about stuff going on, um, not finding the program working very well. <laughs> it was essentially just like it was an outpatient. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I was, I was that guy that, um, that sat in the back of the room, um, and found the other people that didn't really want to be there and would talk to them and say, you know, find out all the things that are wrong with everybody and what's wrong with the program and what's wrong with, with, with what people are saying and what people are wearing. And, and I wasn't, Involved. I wasn't involved. Uh, there came a point when 
I got so, I got so spiritually unfit as I know it is today. Then it was just the screaming monkeys in my mind got got so loud that I had to, uh, I had to take some kind of an action, and that action was for me to just say, okay, whatever these guys are saying here in this room, I'm just going to go ahead and do. It doesn't even matter. I'm not going to question it. I'm going to do what my sponsor says. I'm going to do what outpatient is telling me, and I'm just going to try the best that I could. Um, the program that was offered to me was not exactly as outlined in the big book. Um, there, was, uh, there was an inventory that wasn't a four-column inventory. It was a life story style inventory. Um, the amends that I made, uh, looking back on them now, many of them I, I should have never made. Um, but I had a willingness and a desperation that allowed me to go out there and do just whatever because I recognized that I couldn't do it on my own. Um, that's actually where I wanted to start tonight. I wanted to start tonight on, um, on the first ninth step promise. Well, I guess it's the second one. If you count, we'll be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. <coughs> to me, what that means today is that I have an option. I have a choice not to listen to what's going on in my head. My head is sitting here right now and saying, um, you're not going to sound good. You're going to let your friends down. Um, uh, things aren't going to come out right. Um, you know, what are people going to think? What are people going to say? Um, but I have a choice today not to listen to that. Um, what I thought a new freedom and a new happiness meant when I read them on the wall and I saw them before I actually got to the point where I was well into my amends was that I was going to be happy all the time. Things were going to be great all the time. Life was going to go my way. This is what I thought that promise meant. Well, I'm going to be free. So for me to be free, the only way I could comprehend that is that things are going to happen the way I want them to happen. Uh, today, that freedom means that I, I have access to a power that can walk me through any situation, that can guide me toward how to fulfill my real purpose in life. You know, another promise in here, and, and I was talking with Ian about it before we got a slice of pizza. Uh, my life didn't have any purpose. You know, my, my purpose in life, my, what, I, what I thought I wanted was, you know, okay, make a bunch of money, get a bunch of stuff, because that was going to make me feel okay, right? I was going to gain a lot of things to make me feel okay. Um, <laughs> my purpose is to fit myself to be of service to God and to others, alcoholics, non-alcoholics, however I can be of service. Um, if I go through this process and continue to go through this process, then I have a purpose laid out. The purpose isn't to fulfill what's going on up here, these things that are telling me this is what you need to be okay. I, I start out from a place of okayness. I start out already okay, and then now I can act. Now I can be. Now I can give without any need for anything in return, without any need for recognition, without any need to be the best. Now, recognition, to be the best, are the only things that drove me. And even when I could have been, at least in my opinion, right, the best, even when I could have been recognized, that still wasn't enough. That still didn't even, didn't even come close to solving the, the feeling of missing, the feeling of restlessness, the feeling of discontentness with life. Uh, so I'm going to bring Ian up again. Did he have anything to say? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. And we'll, we're just going to bounce back and forth. And, you know, one of the things I want to share is... Um, you know, jo Jonathan's modest, and he doesn't. He didn't want to say his uh, sobriety date. But what did you celebrate this year? How many years? Eleven. Eleven years. So, you know, which and Jonathan came in as really young. He's probably t over twenty years younger than me, 
and not married, and yet I go to Jonathan, and this is this this is a promise of recovery. Like, you know, like I go to Jonathan for spiritual advice, for talk to stuff that's going on in my life with my wife that he has no experience, but he's got a God consciousness to bring me back into a point of centeredness, and and we discuss it, and it's um, it's really wonderful, um, and it just a. Uh, if you don't know Jonathan, he's some unbelievable guy to get to know. You know so I'm just going to pop through a couple other promises that you know come out in the book that are just not normally spoken about, and that we um, and bring it out. It comes into uh, to my my life currently. You know, um, right in the forward to the first edition that we've recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. I mean, that's that's a miracle. You know, like uh, what Jonathan was saying about not having to worry about the craziness in the head. You know, I stand here a recovered alcoholic today. I don't come up and say, I'm Ian, I'm a recovered alcoholic. But right now, right here, right this moment, God has taken the obsession for me to drink away I'm not living in a spiritual malady and I don't have a physical craving because I have nothing in my system to start the allergy. That's, you know, that's a miracle. And, and that's a promise that can come to anybody. It says, and, and anybody, if you're non-alcoholic and just a hard drinker, it says that our way of living has its advantages for all. This, so these 12 steps have been, you know, sent out to, I can't tell you how many. I was once online looking at, you know, how many anonymouses. I saw Chapstick Anonymous, you know. <laughs> you know, I saw stuff that I couldn't, uh, you know, m- Clutter clutter Anonymous and Clutter's Living with Clutterers Anonymous. And so, you know, it, it's, you know, it's clearly that this way of, Living has its uh, we, means for all the, you know, to live in a in a an environment inside of you that is doing God's will. That's you know not fighting and you know and and fighting with the outside. It's just uh, it's great. You know, um, you know. Later on in the book, and there's a solution. Again, it talks about nearly all have recovered. They have solved their drink problem. You know, when I came in here, I, you know, I wanted to stop drinking or learn how to control my drinking. I didn't know of any way of living, a design for a living that was going to change my life. Um, I just wanted to stop drinking, and I would probably have done anything at that time to stop drinking. And, you know, you got, um, I'm just going to jump a couple. You know, Chris had been up here talking about something. Hey, here's a, a hidden promise for me. And for me, any statement of hope is a promise. You know, if you read a sentence, there's no, you know, set promises. You Some people see their promises. Others see theirs. There's You can go online and search promises. There's the nine-step promises we all know. But if it's a statement of hope to me, it's a promise. Um, you know, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path, Chris had spoke. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What a huge promise. You know, if you follow this path, you know, rarely have they seen anybody fail. They wrote this, you know, some 30, 1939. So how many years ago it is, a, you know, but it's a long time to still be working the same process. <laughs> a long time. Um, you know, some some beautiful, beautiful promises come um, come around the third step. You know, as you're going into the third step, it talks about God makes that possible. And, uh, you know, with this concept uh, was the keystone that a new and triumphant arc through which we pass through freedom. You know, when we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer being all powerful. He provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more, we became interested in seeing what we can contribute to life 
as we felt the new power flow in, as we enjoyed a peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of his presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, and hereafter. We were reborn. You know, this, this was written after they went through, the, you know, after they went through the steps, they came back and wrote this book to pass this around. So I didn't really grasp these promises as I was coming into the third step. But as I was making amends and living in steps 10, 11, and 12 and taking other people through the work and practicing these principles in all my affairs, I could really enjoy these third step promises and have a whole new third step experience, understanding what it's like to have a new employer. And, uh, you know, and someone once pointed out to me early on, even though you have a new employer, you have to show up to work. You know, you know, you can't just get a new employer and expect not to show up for work. You know, so you got to do the work. Um, you know, I'll jump to one more, and then I'm going to let Jonathan, he, you know, talk. I want to talk a little bit about something from the fifth step promises. You know, which are, you know, another powerful set of promises. You know, and there's some warnings too that come with these promises. You know, earlier in the fifth step it says if we uh, if we skip this vital step we may not overcome drinking I mean that's you know if, that's a promise of in its own sense um, and it, and I know that and you know I'm sure anybody that's really been through a fifth step um, and just doesn't want to let those one or two things go and think you're just going to hold them back and hold them back and you know, luckily I have a uh, a gentleman who took me through the work who kind of figured that I was going to be doing that too, and he sucked those two things out of me, and uh, and and he let me know like three or four times, have we been through it? Have you been through it? Do do I know everything? Is there anything you want to share with me? No, no, no. He goes, well, I'm going to leave you for a couple minutes. I just want you to read that line. If you skip this vital step, you may not overcome drinking. So all the work you did, everything you got to this point may be useless. You know, and he came, all right, I'll tell you. And, uh, (laughs) you know, and, but once I did that and, and these two things which were ridiculous came out, he read with me the, you know, you know, once we have taken this step, withholding nothing, we are delighted. We can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel a nearness of our Creator. We have made certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. Not a spiritual awakening as a result of completing the steps. You need to finish up, but a spiritual experience. That was something I didn't understand until I got further through. Um, the feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. It's nice. And we feel we're on the broad highway walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. You know, all I could say is that when I first came in here, and I'm sure some people will be able to identify, I couldn't look the world in the eye. I couldn't even look myself in the eye. You know, I was afraid of everything. I was afraid of going anywhere. I was afraid of who I was going to see. My wife um, made a surprise party for me when I was 40 years old. And when I caught wind of it and saw who she invited, I went berserk. I was trying to cancel the party. I didn't want these people there. I owed them money. I owed them, a, you know. <laughs> you know, some of these people were coming to the surprise party because they were hunting me down. <laughs> you know, you know. You know. Then I look at the, you know. I could, but today I could go. You know, she can throw, and she couldn't understand. I ruined that party for her. It was, a, you know, it was a horrible thing. She was looking so forward to having this party, and I really just ruined the whole thing. Out of fear, out of fear of the people, who, I couldn't look the world in the eye. You know, I didn't have the the benefits of 
the program of recovery in my life as I do today. I'm going to let Jonathan jump in and throw some stuff far away. All right. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, some good stuff. The uh, the third step promises, the fifth step promises. Um, I like to uh, to use the third step promises as uh, as considerations, or, or I'll turn them around into questions to see, um, am I really living this way? Am I turning my will and my life over to God, or am I still trying to control things in my life? Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. You know, h- how interested in getting my agenda accomplished. How interested in making, making the things that I feel need to happen today, forcing them to happen, no matter who gets stepped on, no matter who uh, I'm rude to or I'm mean to, um, or what else that other people want to do. Do I take that into consideration? Or am I just going out there trying to make what I want to happen happen, all the while saying to myself, well, you know, this is what's best for everybody. If only these things happen, then, 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 then people will really be happy. This will, you know, everybody at work will be happy, everybody at home. Um, always having these reasons. So, so how interested am I in, in pushing my agenda? More and more we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. How interested am I in seeing what I can contribute to life? Or another way of looking at that is, how interested am I in seeing what I can get? What can I get out of this? What is the situation going to give me? As we felt new power flow in, do I feel this power flow in? This power that's spoken about throughout the big book? Uh, or, or not? You know, If I'm not feeling this power, then as has already been mentioned a couple of times, I'm not working, I'm not working the program as outlined. Because I'm promised that I'm going to feel some power coming in. As we enjoyed peace of mind, do I enjoy peace of mind? Can I sit still? Can I sit by myself and be okay? Do I constantly have to be on the move? As we discovered we could face life successfully. That actually brings to mind a funny story. I, I, much like this fear of speaking that I have, I have this fear of dancing. Um, oh, man, am I scared Welcome. of dancing. Keep coming back. Thank you. So, so whenever there's a wedding coming up, um, there's only one thing that I think about. Even if it's like, you know, you get to save the date six months in advance. I think to myself, oh, man, in six months I'm going to have to dance. <laughs> it's, it's pretty sick, right? But... Um, yeah. So, so I had this wedding this weekend, and um, and and all the while I'm going into it, and uh, you know I, I I know that I have this fear of dancing, and uh, but my purpose isn't to go and make myself feel good, right? My purpose is to be there for the the couple that's getting married, for my friends, for the people that I'm with, for my girlfriend who's come with me, for the people at our table, for my family, right? And if I'm that guy. This is for myself speaking, sitting at the table or, you know, going out and trying to find other stuff to do. I'm not involved in, in, in the happiness. I'm not involved in the occasion. I'm not involved in the whole reason why I'm there. So what do I do? Well, I pray. You know, dear God, please remove my fear of dancing and direct me to what you would have me be. I can then be open to if I go dance, hey, that's fine. And what happens, a new experience. And what happens inevitably when I approach it that way is, uh, is I go out and I get on the dance floor and, and it's not so bad. It's not so bad. That's a silly little example there. Uh, Wait, Lisa, you have, some, you have some music here? Let's see. You guys do not want to see my moves. It's like a lane from Seinfeld. <laughs> As we became conscious of his presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter. We were reborn. All right, I think I'm going to bring Ian up with that. Okay, I'm still Ian, I'm an alcoholic. And uh, I'm going to jump over to um, 
some promises. If you come down to Union on Thursday nights, we read these uh, at the end of the meeting. And it's something, uh, you know, I'm going to single out Rob over there. But, uh, I, I, you know, Rob and I talk about these all the time, you know, that, uh, you know, what what happens, you know, when you do the work, you know, when you've come through the ninth step. Not that you've completed every amends, but, you, you know, you, you've made your approaches. You, you may have payouts to do. You have your list. You were willing. Um, you know, the, and I was just at a meeting the other day, and, uh, a 10-step meeting. And the 10-step promises are so powerful in my life. You know, it says, and we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. Um, for by this time, sanity will have returned. You know, for me, I read that as the, the, the sanity, the insane thinkings that I used to think regarding uh, that I, I can drink this time and it'll be different. I can just have one, you know, the, the first drink, you know. And, you know, now that's returned, you know. A huge promise. I don't, I don't have to think about whether... Um, it's going to be any different this time. I know, you know, I go through this work and I go through the the amends process um, not so much because my life was unmanageable in the spiritual malady because I'm powerless over alcohol and I need God. I need the power. And when I forget that, you know, my whole attitude and outlook towards this work will change. And... uh you know, so it's 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 keeping that power, you know, and then everything else changes with it. And I believe that's why early in the book when it talks about um, this program has its advantages to all. Not every, you know, there may be people that have spiritual maladies and other addictions and, you know, and all the other steps work. But it's being powerless over alcohol that makes the real alcoholic different from everybody else and it's what keeps me in this work um, we will seldom be interested in liquor if tempted we will recoil from it from a hot flame we act sanely and normally and we find that this has happened automatically we see that our new attitude towards liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part it just comes God just boom that is the miracle of it. We are not fighting, neither are we avoiding temptation. doesn't mean because I'm a, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, I don't go to weddings. I don't go places. My motives are right. I'm not worried. You know, I'm, it says here, uh, we feel as though we had been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. The problem has been removed. If you're alcoholic, my, and, you know, that line was brought to me early on, you know, is, is this something that you would like to have the problem be removed? And this gentleman said to me, I will promise you, if you go through this work as outlined in here, you, you go through the considerations, find your truth that you're an alcoholic. You know, make a decision to go forward with steps four through nine and do this. You're going to get to this point and the problem will be removed. It's, you know, that's a miracle for some, for a hopeless alcoholic to come in and to, to say the problem has been removed. Um, it does not exist for us. We are not cocky, nor are we afraid. And, you know, that is how we act so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. Again, we go through the work. We, we do the work with others. Um, I, I'll tell you, and, uh, and there's some people in this room that know me. Uh, I sought this recovery like it was the only thing in my life I ever wanted. When I caught a taste of this stuff, when I started feeling these promises... I went out and I seeked this stuff and I found recovered alcoholics and I wanted to know how they recovered. You know, I'd never heard of a recovered alcoholic. 
I was going to meetings and I went back, you know, I went back to a meeting a couple weeks ago and, uh, that I hadn't been in a while and they're talking about stick with the winners. Was everyone else a loser? You know, okay, we're not going to make judgments. Just stick with the winners. You know, the rest of the group's losers, but no judgments here. Um, you know, there was a celebration that night, and I went um, to see a woman celebrate that I know that had, you know, quite a lot of uh, time in the fellowship, and uh, and I sat there one after another, and someone else was here with me. Um, not one person out of that 14 celebrants mentioned that they're sober today because of God or because of uh, a higher power. You know, they're sober today because of what they did, you know, how they keep themselves sober. So I guess they're not powerless. They can keep themselves sober. They don't need these book, the promises. It just, that stuff doesn't work for me. And uh, I needed to find people that had been through this work and that are living a life that I always dreamed of. You know, many years ago, I have a business partner and uh, who, you know, we, we meet people in these, in life that live spiritually normally. You know, and it, that stuff never really, I didn't quite understand it before, but, you know, here's a guy that was never afraid to say no when he needed to say no. You know, who was outright honest to the T. You know, he, he would always go into a business deal in, in pure intentions in a spiritual manner. And I always used to say, you know, I don't know what's wrong with me. Why can't I be like Richie? You know, why did I have to lie in this deal? Or why do, why can't I just say no when I don't want to do something and just say, oh yeah, I'll do it. And then afterwards I got a 15 resentments about the whole process because I just couldn't say no to begin with. And if I just said no, nobody would have cared. And now I just, you know, created problems of my own making, you know, and created a whole train of, 15 people that can't stand me because not only didn't I do, I didn't want to do it to begin with. Um, Anyhow, I'm off on a little bit, but, you know, I'm going to say a couple other quick things. I'm going to let Jonathan finish up a couple, and then we're going to bring Chris up to close this workshop out um, as he started it. And really just want to let, you know, just thank you guys for this type of, uh, as Chris would say, pocket of enthusiasm to bring, to seek the solution. It's really a, a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, one of the, the last promises in our program of recovery um, comes out of the Vision for You ch- chapter. And it says, uh, it's talking about your relationship with God. And it says, He will show you how to create the fellowship you crave. Um, you have it here. You know, this wasn't existing in here, and I'm not sure who, Paul, Lisa, some a group of your home group members, you created a fellowship you crave here. Um, that God will constantly disclose more to you and us. You know, if you seek, the answers will come. Great events will come to pass for you and countless others. Yeah, you know, what, what more is there to say? And, and You will surely meet some of us as you trudge through the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you till then. Thank you. Yeah, as Ian was reading the the twelfth, the tenth step promises, um, it came to mind the uh, the power of alcohol in my life. I'm going to try to paint a picture. I don't have much time here, but uh, I was a uh, I was a very insecure kid growing up, um, uh, attention seeking, um, needing to fit in, and all this stuff, right? So I found somehow I found skateboarding, right? And uh, that's one of the things that I had to become the best at. So I, I, I practiced all the time, and I practiced, and it was it became my life. And I, I, through skateboarding, it was so important to me because through skateboarding, I was able to 
um, gain friends and, and comradeship, and, and we would go out and do stuff together, and I started to feel a part of something. For the first time in my life, um, it was probably the most important thing in my life, um, till I, till, till I found alcohol. And, um, in the first time that I drank and got drunk, uh, my experience was that this was the answer. This was the answer to my problems. This was the answer to life. This is what everybody else already knew about and probably how they all felt. But this is what I need to feel this way. So I'm going to go ahead and do it as much and as often as possible. And, uh, to put it lightly, it left skateboarding in the dust. My new friends that I got, the new stuff that I was doing, um, all meant nothing, nothing compared to alcohol. Um, that is not something that could have been removed by anything that I did on my own. Um, yeah, I had to come to the belief that, you know, well, by, by going to a bunch of meetings and, uh, and, and talking to, to people about stuff, uh, not, not, not step work, stuff, um, that, uh, that this was keeping me sober and this is what I need to do to keep me sober till, uh, till my sponsor offered to me, you know, uh, yeah. well, how do you stay sober? And, and how, is, how is sobriety working for you? <laughs> and I had to think to myself, you know, uh, I don't know. And it kind of sucks. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was left with no choice. I was left with, with, with no choice but to throw myself into the work. Um, this happened about two years ago or so um, when, uh, when I got really upset about the question of alcoholism. And, uh, and I, got, I got bothered. I got bothered with the question of alcoholism and had to re-explore my truth of whether I am or am not an alcoholic um, and, and found the truth and found that I only had one, one way out to get connected to a power that's going to show me how to live free. That's better than skateboarding. That's better than alcohol. Um, that's available to us all. Thank you. Bring Chris up. Great job. Uh, All right. We got a couple of minutes left here. You know, um, to be part of uh, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, to have experienced the recovery program of Alcoholics Anonymous, that translates into gratitude. Uh, it translates into a lifestyle that uh, embraces compassion, uh, love, joy. In, in the 12 and 12, um, I love the big book. I, I, like, I like the 12 and 12 too. In the 12 and 12, it basically starts off, uh, who among us wishes to admit complete defeat? Uh, glass in hand, we've warped our minds to such a degree that only an act of divine providence can relieve us. Um, it goes from stats to the beginning of step one. As you start to open the chapter on step 12, it talks about the joy of living. The joy of living is what the 12th step is all about. I don't know about anybody else, but what I was looking for all along in alcohol uh, and drugs were, were a joy of living. I needed to be able to feel a part of. I needed to touch a little bit of the divine. I needed to get rid of that anxiety and that fear that I had in me. I needed to be able to step out and just, you know, do what I needed to do without having any of the emotional crap that was going on in my head. I just wanted to, to, to really enjoy life. And really the main promise at the end of the line in the steps is the joy of living. Anybody that's been through the steps understands what I'm talking about. It's very, very difficult to understand uh, the joy of living if you're alcoholic and you've not been through the steps. You only know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. And because this is an experiential process and each step basically unfolds uh, as you actually take it, it's very difficult to make assumptions on steps that you haven't had. But anybody that's got through the steps and has begun the process of working with others, 
is trying to practice these recovery and spiritual principles in their affairs to the best of whatever ability they have at that time, are embarking upon uh, a joy of living. And I will say this again, that's the best deal out there. That is the best deal out there. I want to thank this group so much for having uh, having us down here. I've had a blast. It's been a great experience. Uh, you know, I hear that there's some more really good things coming down the road. I, I hope uh, I hope that you keep up a little bit of the momentum with uh, you know with uh, with the recovery processes. And uh, God bless you all. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.